Hello, I just got out of seeing a new Star Wars movie, um, specifically Rogue One, and I want to give my thoughts on it. I'm going to try to keep spoilers to a minimum. There will be some non-narrative related spoilers in this in, in this review, but there are certain things which I kind of need to talk about about the film that are somewhat spoiler-ish. Um, what did you characters who appear in the film? I will not be getting into who lives and who dies. There are things you can probably infer based on what I say if you're familiar with genre and that sort of thing. But I'm not going to give away the ship, give away the store. There, you should come out of this with the enough information to make your decision if you haven't seen it already on whether you should see the film or not. So, Rogue One, a Star Wars tale. This is a story which, in the old expanded universe, and we'll be getting to this on the Legends of the Force series in good time, which gets into a portion of the expanded universe that we have had seen before, and we're seeing told in a new fashion here. This is the story of how the Death Star plans reach the Rebel Alliance. If you are from, if you remember the opening crawl of A New Hope, there's a brief little bit in there of rebel spies have retrieved the plans for the Empire's new Death Star and sent them to Princess Leia. And now Princess Leia is on her way to ta to get a new ally, to find an ally who will turn the corner of her resistance to the galaxy and to get these plans to the Alliance HQ. And this film takes that one like short sentence in the crawl and basically recognizes there's a whole story behind just this one sentence we're gonna tell it and honestly i think this is better than how it was done in the old expanded universe because the way it was done in the old legends timeline the old expanded universe timeline is it was a the first level of star wars dark forces the first level of dark forces was you steal the death star plans and then the rest and then the rest of the game goes and tells the bigger story about the Death Troopers, which undersells the stealing of the Death Star plans because that is a turning point in the Rebel Alliance and a turning point in the war against the Empire and which sets in motion everything that happens, almost everything that happens in A New Hope. So while I loved that moment in Dark Forces where you're dropped into this facility and you get the plans, and he goes, holy crap, these are the Death Star plans I've just claimed. This is kind of awesome. On the other hand, I was really like, is this it? Is this all there is with the Death Star plans? And the answer for Rogue One is, basically, by taking the Legends timeline and throwing out the old explanation, and saying, hey, we're going to tell our new way, we're honestly able to tell a new story. This is kind of one of the situations where I'd say, the new timeline is an improvement over the old timeline. So, the premise of the film is Galen Erso is a imperial scientist who is working, who has been captured by the Empire and has been basically tasked with designing the power systems for the Death Star. The thing that makes, that provides the juice, that makes the super laser cause planets go boom. 
and his daughter Jin is on the run. She's been on the run basically since she was a young girl and been working off and on with Saw Gerrera. Saw Gerrera is a character who has appeared in Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. So we're tying the television f continuity and the film continuity together in a way that we really haven't done before. Like, not just in terms of the films or in terms of of the Star Wars continuity, but like of the of Disney's two big expanded universes, um, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the uh, DC Cinematic uh, and Marvel and Star Wars Cinematic Universes, they haven't done this with really that much in Star Wars. Um, Agents of Shield has done little bits and pieces behind the scenes. Um, we had like they they've done brief explanations of stuff, but we've never had a character from Agents of Shield fully jump over to the MCU to the same degree. It's not like, oh, for example, any of the Inhumans have been started showing up in Marvel movies or anything like that. With this film, we are taking these chunks and combining together in a way that the Marvel Star Wars or the, that the Marvel E. Um, cinematic universe, the MCU has never really done so. And so that's a big, big deal there. The other big thing we have here that's um, coming up here is we have a almost Jedi free Star Wars story. Of the seven films we've gotten thus far, they all in some form or another have Jedi in them. In the case of the prequels, we have Jedi all up in this sucker. So, Jedi all up in this. Jedi, Jedi AF. So, this film, there are characters who are, there's a character who is slightly for sense. Let's talk a bit about our cast. We have um, Jin Erso, our female lead. This is our second Star Wars film that's really got a big female lead in it. Uh... We have Cassian Andor, who is a rebel operative who's basically serving as Jin Erso's case officer. We have K2SO, his robot assistant, who is a reprogrammed Imperial droid. Chirut Imwe, who is a um, who is played by Donnie Yen, which occupies the cast. Jin Erso, played by Felicity Jones. Cassian Andor, played by Diego Luna. Sk2SO is a digital character, digital somewhat puppy, puppy puppet character, played by, uh, or voiced rather by Alan Tudyk, who was on set for basically all of his scenes. So he's actually there for actors to play off of, as opposed to, for example, to draw a connection with the Star Trek franchise when you had Star um, Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. You never had um, Shatner and... Uh, Ricardo Montalban on set at the same time to play off of each other. Even if they're never face-to-face -face on screen, they also were not reading their lines off to each other. There is Baze Malbus, played by Jiang Wen, and Bodhi Rook. Um, Sirit and Baze are both sort of warrior monks from the planet Jetta who are were from the temple there. Their task was Guardians of the Wills. So this is actually a reference to the sort of unofficial subtitle of the Star Wars series going back to Lucas, the Journal of the Wills. All of these were a tale of the Journal of the Wills. And um, the so the Guardians of the Wills, these would theoretically be keep protectors of the people who are keeping the Journal of the Wills. And they are from you know, the planet Jedha, which... is not sure how much of it is is um, in previous works. I do not believe that... I think it's new to Rogue One. Um, there's mention there's a big Jedi temple there, or subsidiary Jedi temple there, but it's not a planet that's appeared in previous Star Wars continuity, whether in uh, Clone Wars or... Rebels, or for that matter, the Tales of the Jedi series, which in Legends of the Force, I'm going to be coming to soonish. I'm, I've almost finished with the Marvel and the novel stuff. So anyway, so that's that's something that's coming up. 
and Bodhi Rook, who is played by Riz Ahmed, who is a former Imperial pilot who has defected to the Rebel Alliance with information that is vital to the cause, which helps set everything in motion. <clears throat> so, when it comes to a, new, to a New Hope, A New Hope is a lot of film stuck together. It's Flash Gordon space opera ac- ray gun action. It's um, as has been discussed at great length by numerous, numerous film critics and film scholars of all stripes in books, magazines, documentaries, what have you. It is Flash Gordon, Kurosawa's film, The Hidden Fortress, and of particular note, why I bring up here, the film The Dam Busters, which is a World War II action film made after the war, based around a major bombing raid to destroy several Nazi dams to disrupt uh, German industrial production by flooding a portion of the Rhine River Valley, I believe it was, and also by these were hydroelectric dams were generating massive amounts of power to power the manufacturing arm of the Nazi war machine. I bring up the dam busters as a particular focus because if that because if Star Wars is Flash Gordon plus the Dam Busters with the side of the um, Hidden Fortress, this film is Flash Gordon meets the Dirty Dozen. If you're familiar with the film The Dirty Dozen, it is if you're unfamiliar, the premise of it, in short, is misfit group of Allied special forces are dropped behind enemy lines including a token black guy who can't pass among the Germans because so he can get gratuitously killed off, because this was the 70s, uh, who are sent on a mission to kill Nazi generals, gather information, disrupt the Nazi infrastructure, that sort of thing. A similarly applicable film would be The Guns of Navarone. Probably almost even more applicable film would be Guns of Navarone. Guns of Navarone, if you haven't seen that one, is premise of it is Allied Special Forces team, again, bunch of misfits, sent on a potentially suicide mission to demo- to take out a group of Nazi artillery, uh, heavily fortified artillery em- emplacements that are uh, shelling and taking out ships going into the Mediterranean. That while the Allies have Gibraltar, just because ships can get past Gibraltar doesn't mean they're safe. So, with this, um, it's not a destroy the target mission. It's a steal the information mission. We're, we're stealing the Death Star plan. The Alliance discovers the existence of the Death Star, seeks out the Death... Um, and ba- once they learn that the Death Star exists and there's a weakness, from there, head out, okay, we're going to try and get the Death Star plans and get those to the Republic. And so, on the one hand, we know, Star Wars fans, we know the ultimate success of this mission. Princess Leia is going to get the plans on the Tantive Four. She's going to end up over Tatooine, pursued by Vader, who's hot on her heels. And the opening of A New Hope happens from there. But we don't know how we get there from here. And we don't know who's going to make it. And that is where this film's tension comes in. Is we know is who who lives and who dies. None of the characters in this film, with a couple exceptions, are people who appear in A New Hope, as far as major characters. We see, and this is stuff people appear in the trailers, we see Mom Mothma. Um, we have a return appearance of, uh, Bail Organa from the prequel films, in particular, episode three. So it's not like we've forgotten that the prequels exist, but we we have the return of Bail Organa as part of the earlier alliance. We have Jan Dodonna, played by a different actor this time, on the rebel base on Yavin 4, and... 
Okay, we know they're going to make it. Mon Mothma's on um, the Rebel command ship at the end of, or at the, at the beginning of um, Return of the Jedi, when we get the briefing for the Death Star 2 mission. Uh, that sort of thing. And so we get everybody together. And so the, the rest of the team put you up in the air. And I appreciate that. I, the thing I like about prequels, the, the thing that that, that that some people don't like them, I'm on the fence about them, depending on how they're handled. What makes a prequel work or fail is how much you can say in terms of who lives and who dies, who makes it out, and that sort of thing. And by doing this as a structurally a World War II behind enemy lines special operations mission, there is that sense of tension and risk of these are people who, like, you know from the genre conventions, not everyone's going to make it out alive. The question is who does or who doesn't. And so there's that. Now, Gareth Edwards, I have not seen his work on Monster, but I have seen his work on the Godzilla, American Godzilla movie. And he's good at doing ground-level combat and action and that sort of thing. And he pulls it off really well here. This is a... Even then, like... What we get in this film is different than anything Gareth Edwards has done in his other films before, because we are dealing with Star Wars-style Flash Gordon action. And so what we get here is we get a mix of ground-level combat and that sort of thing with rebel troopers on the ground, with rebel agents going through towns and that sort of thing, getting in fights with stormtroopers in various cities and that sort of stuff. And that is all... If you've seen Gareth Edwards' other work, you kind of get an idea where he's going from with this. Um, it's He has rebel troopers moving like soldiers and that sort of thing. It's clear. It is clear how much military involvement in films and having ex-military people devising actors and putting them through boot camp and that sort of thing has changed how the action of film has been shot in terms of use of cover, advancement, and under fire, and that sort of thing. How how compared to the way firefights were shot in on the rebel ships in a new hope and how things have changed here where the new hope soldiers kind of moves like ordinary people in a firefight how you think an ordinary person or extra actor who's trying to act like a act like they're in a firefight would move um particularly with stormtroopers and that sort of thing here you have we're living in a post black hawk down world and you can tell by how the action scenes are shot on the ground starfighter action it is classic star wars with a little bit of a twist with because we have digital technology and that sort of thing we can have more close in shots on the x wings and the new u wings and that sort of thing and y wings as they do their bombing runs and that sort of stuff there are shots which you expect to see in, in camera angles, in particular, which you expect to see in Star Wars movies, that you're still going to see here. And Gareth Edwards pulls off the language of the Star Wars fighter combat, a uh, fighter combat incredibly well. And it says so much about Star Wars and what we expect coming into these movies after seven previous films that have been made where Star Wars has developed its own language to, for fighter combat that is completely different from what everyone else has done from your World War II fighter combat movies like The Flying Tigers to movies like Top Gun, which are using actual F-16s and that sort of stuff, to movies like Stealth, which I haven't seen, where... How and how the language of modern fighter combat works. It is very interesting, and it's very cool to watch on the screen. And it's a language which, on the one... Which, because there are only really seven films that have used this language in the past, actually, technically, six, because we don't have a big dogfight. Actually, you want to be really nitpicky, we only have five, because... A new hope because um, Attack of the Clones and Empire Strikes Back don't have big starfighter dogfights. That it really changes that it changes the flow of things, and or not changes the flow, but it's it's its own language that 
while there are only five samples of it, and they're really well-documented samples that everyone has seen and everyone loves, it's certainly something where you have to step into somebody else's shoes to get this language right. And while three of these five films have been directed by George Lucas, two of them haven't, and that also means something. Yes, there's fighter dogfight stuff in the Clone Wars television series and Rebels and that sort of thing, but still, it's a very different thing. So, there's that. And this will get the slight spoiler thing is because this is a prequel film and because this is based around the construction of the Death Star, there are certain characters who may appear. And there's always been the question of how are these characters going to be handled? We have been told up front, Vader is going to be in this film. He's been all over the trailer materials with the, you had Vader's breath and that sort of thing. And we've heard that James Earl Jones was coming back to voice Vader again. Like, okay, so Vader's in there. Is Palpatine going to be present? Is Tarkin going to be present? This is their era. This is their time. This is, they are power players. And we are before the Dapper's Death Star is destroyed and Tarkin is killed. So, what do we get with these characters? Also, doubly worth noticing because when we get to the expanded universe, both the intercool period um, well, works that cover pre-Star Wars, but even afterwards, Tarkin still comes up a bunch. We have the Imperial discussion of the Tarkin Doctrine in the Legends continuity. And we have characters who are coming later, like Admiral Dalla, who had personal connections to Tarkin, and thus have their own responses to the heroes of the Republic, the heroes of Yavin and Endor, like Luke and Leia, or particularly the heroes of Yavin, like Luke and Leia and Han, because of their role in Tarkin's death. So, will Tarkin show up? Will the Emperor show up? The Emperor is, Emperor is kind of a big deal, and the, the Death Star is kind of an important project for him. So, will the Emperor show up? Will we? So, to answer questions, Palpatine does not show up. I'm, I'm actually a little disappointed by that, but kind of would have been cool to have Palpatine show up. There was a moment where we think he's going to show up, but not quite. Um, but Vader shows up, and Vader's scene is very cool and very well done. He has, he has two major scenes, and Tarkin appears. And Tarkin is interesting. So, in the one scene appearance by Tarkin in the prequel trilogy, he is played by the actor who plays Scorpius on Farscape, Wayne Pygram. Um... Wayne Pygram's the one act. Pygram's the one actor who can probably fill Peter Cushing's cheekbones the best. And what we get, and sadly, Wayne Pygram does not return as the voice of Tarkin here, because it's a shame. Because Wayne Pygram, when I think of his vocal cadences as Scorpius, and I think of Peter Cushing's vocal cadences as Tarkin, they just mesh so wonderfully. I almost wonder if. Pygram's direction that he received as Scorpius was, talk like you are Peter Cushing playing Grand Moff Tarkin. Because he certainly nails it. But, what instead we get is we have another actor voicing Peter Cushing, and then Peter Cushing's face as Tarkin is used digitally. We have a digital version of Tarkin, what we guess we call a ink suit actor, to use the TV tropes term. And it is interesting seeing this because some people it's jarring. Some people, for me, it, I didn't hate it. It did to a certain degree knock me out of the film every time because like, holy crap, that's Peter Cushing. How is it Peter Cushing? Because he's dead. It can't actually be Peter Cushing. They made a digital Peter Cushing, but it works. It really, really works. And actor they got to voice Cushing, or the voice Tarkin, nails it. It's not Wayne Pygram. But it works, and it's clear what they did is they had an actor with dots all over his face in these scenes, and they used his facial motions, and that sort of thing, his facial animation, to build how Tarkin's, how, how Peter Cushing's face would look based on that. And it works in my book. It might not work for you, but 
I thought it was really impressively done. And I'm interested to see what happens with this technology in the future. Because this film could change... How this effect is done here could change everything. I'm not saying that Coppola is going to go and make a new Godfather interquel with um, Brant, with an actor dotted up and digitally replicating the face of Marlon Brando. I'm not saying they're going to get a prequel made to Apocalypse Now showing the rise of Colonel Kurtz and or the fall, rather, of Colonel Kurtz. Um, setting up where he is and the chunk of Vietnam and Cambodia he has chopped out at the beginning of Apocalypse Now. But this is technology that could allow, that, that could do very interesting things for filmmaking and directorial decisions and casting. Because we're at a point, for example, like for, for how this is done, where if you want to do young digital Kurt Russell as, say, Snake Plissken, or for or another character, you could probably do it as far as pull it off. Now. As the line goes from Jurassic Park, just because you knew, saw that you could do it doesn't mean that you should do it. But the point still stands, is the technology is here now. Gareth Edwards appears to have handled it well. And in the hands of Kathleen Kennedy and the Star Wars Expanded Universe team, or Cinematic Universe team, they appear to have handled this well. And the question now goes from here, where do else do we go with this? And what else comes out of this? And what does this mean when it comes to, say, making actors who perhaps don't look anything like a cinematic, like a cinematic character they'll be playing, turning them into a, per, into the digital character, into human digital characters who perhaps aren't, like, I guess the way I put it, for example, if we ever get the Robotech movie, and instead of casting an actor who looks like Rick Hunter, what if you cast an actor who looks just close enough like Rick Hunter, and then you design a humanoid face, a human face that looks close enough like a actual human Rick Hunter, and then digitally overlay that on that actor? Or various other things. So, we will see how this turns out in future films. We have the Han Solo movie coming up. We have actual actors cast to play young Han Solo and young, younger Lando Calrissian. And we have yet to hear anything about them. Oh, we're going to digitally make these actors look like young Harrison Ford and young Billy Dee Williams. But what about other characters in these movies? And that's the interesting question. So, should you see Rogue One? Absolutely. It's a wonderfully done film. It really hits the right notes of the World War II behind enemy lines potential suicide mission in space. Or rather, in done with a with the Star Wars Flash Gordon overlay. And it tells the story very well. It, it is tonally different from what you might think from a normal Star Wars movie. Because it's that dirty dozen, that Guns of Navarone style story, where you know not everyone's going to make it out. And because of the stakes involved, there is a very real risk that everyone's going to make it out. But it's executed well, it's told well, and it's performed well. So... Definitely get a chance to see this movie in theater. And this is certainly a film which I'm looking forward to picking up on DVD and Blu-ray. Particularly the special edition with all the making of stuff. Because I really want to see how they did digital Peter Cushing. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.